Partly I was wanted the challenge of making instruments work. As, as, as well as trying to study the chemistry of the earth, I wanted to make sure I could do something that had to do with constructing instruments. And so I built a device to make the measurements of the concentration of carbon dioxide that was called a manometer. And the manometer I found by reading in the literature something that had been built a long time earlier. And I made some changes because there was new technology, better ground glass stopcocks and so on. And particularly liquid nitrogen was available. Liquid nitrogen being something by, by which I could freeze out the carbon dioxide rather than do it the way it was being done in Scandinavia, where they were absorbing it in a uh, caustic solution and then trying to release it from the solution. And that was a chemical method, which was not as precise as the one I had. So with this precise manometer and the use of liquid nitrogen, I was able to make these measurements quite accurately. So now I compared these measurements with what was going on in Sweden, and I found that it was, they weren't concordant. And I had an opportunity to take some, some of these, uh, well, I haven't told you the device itself. It was a, a, a glass vessel about this big around, and it had a, a closure at the top, so I could actually pump the air out of it and make it a vacuum. And then all they had to do was to turn a little valve on the top, stopcock it's called, and this, the air would go <laughs> and come down in the flask. And then you'd close the stopcock and you could send it anywhere. I was very fortunate that as I was doing this work, there was an internationally organized program to study geophysics, particularly uh, the ionosphere and to, for radio propagation. But it was enlarged to be a much more ambitious program. And it uh, uh, allowed for exploration in many different ways, including oceanographic ships going out all around the world and setting up locations to make measurements. We could call these observing stations. And I got a chance to join this program. It was called the International Geophysical Year. And this wasn't so long after World War II. It was 1957 when it actually occurred. And the, the beginning of the planning that I got involved with was 1956, one year after I had made this discovery about the our measurements being different than people's measurements made by in other places by different techniques. So I was given a chance to join this program and even though to get back to the fact that I was not very old yet, I was about 26 years old when this started, that uh, I had this opportunity to command uh, the samples be taken in quite distant places including the South Pole and uh, ice flows in the Arctic Ocean. Now that's really an opportunity which would not come very often. And so the beginning of the International Geophysical Year, we, we sent some samples to a lot of different places, as I just described, also tropical locations, and they all came back with nearly the same result. In fact, it was so much the same result that when they were published in a bulletin of the International Geophysical Year, which was coming out to let people know what happened, somebody said that it must be that the instrument I was using was stuck, and it was just making the same measurement all the time. But of course, we checked that out, and it wasn't true, and so we went ahead and kept making these measurements. And part of the program came about because I was invited to go to the United States Weather Bureau, which had an office of meteorological research. It wasn't a very big organization, but it did have a chance to take part in this International Geophysical Year. So I went to the director at his invitation and told him about what I was doing. I showed him some of my measurements. He said, we have just recently set up an observatory up on a mountain in Hawaii, and this would be a wonderful place to make these measurements. 
and he was very ambitious to get this station to be more uh, recognized by doing as many things as they could. And so he supported the idea of going out there and not just measuring it by taking a sample now and then in a bottle and bringing it back, but putting an instrument there that would measure it continuously. And meanwhile, I had found an, a company in the Pasadena, California. This company had an instrument, and so they lent me an instrument, and I was able to test it out and find out that it was probably good enough to make these measurements. And so, because of the International Geophysical Year, I was able to buy them. So it was, a, it was expensive, and yet we were able to buy four of these instruments. <laughs> we put one on a ship, we put one in the Antarctic, we put one at Mauna Loa Observatory, and we kept one for ourselves to be able to see how they worked. And that launched the program of making continuous measurements, and the Mauna Loa Observatory began the measurements in 1958. It took nearly the end of the International Geophysical Year period before it got started. But once it was there, it was clear it was going to make some interesting results. What I was trying to lead up to was that the concentration variation that we meant measured at Mauna Loa Observatory was about six parts per million between summer and winter. And that was within the error bar, the, the error of, of what the measurements were being made in Scandinavia, and so they couldn't detect it. But it, it could have been detected long before that if uh, they had been more diligent about it, checking their the precision of what they were doing. So we found that it was, was indeed varying with the seasons. The other remarkable thing was that we found that as we traced it into the second year, it was a little bit higher. And by the third year, it was quite clear that it was going to be higher each year, at least it was being higher each year than it was before for the same time of the year. So we were getting an increase from year to year. And it didn't take that many years because it was going up by nearly a part per million per year. So we had to have that precision of better than one part per million. But with that precision, we saw that it was it was trending upward as well as oscillating between the seasons. <laughs>